Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. Joan Rivers is best known for her acerbic sense of humour, her no-holds-barred critique on the styles and lives of celebrities, and her complete refusal to hold anything, including herself, too sacred. How did Joan Rivers rise from the ashes to become a billionaire? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Rivers was a trailblazer who lived a long and varied life. From stand-up comedy to hosting a late-night show, to designing and selling jewellery on QVC, to writing books, she did it all, and then some. Many were quick to write her off on several occasions, but a fighter through and through, she proved them all wrong. On the go until her death at the age of 81 in 2014, she was relentless in her mission to stay relevant. Let's raise a glass to the self-proclaimed mad diva, Joan Rivers. She was identified by the rasping fingernails on the blackboard voice, which added a frisson to her signature phrase, Can we talk? As she aged, her face and her countless cosmetic operations became another trademark, but her cutting wit, often aimed at herself, was the core of her comedy and proved an asset as she moved into hosting talk shows. Later she found a niche, often alongside her daughter Melissa, interviewing her fellow celebrities and criticising their fashions on the red carpets of the myriad award ceremonies with which the entertainment industry honours itself. I am not the ideal Jewish woman, Joan Rivers admits in a comedy act filmed in the Jewish Women's Archive film Making Trouble. I love to take my audience to the edge, she said. I love to get them upset and ruin their value system. Inevitably, her sarcasm proved too much for the egos of the stars, although she found a unique way of promoting her one-woman show. She was born Joan Alexandra Malinsky, daughter to Russian Jewish immigrants in New York in 1933. Her father, Mayer Malinsky, was a doctor and by all accounts had a great sense of humour. Rivers was obviously a chip off the old block. She was the youngest of two daughters. The Malinsky family eventually moved out to Larchmont, a suburb of New York City. She attended Barnard College, where she pursued her interest in performing. She appeared in numerous campus productions during her time there. After graduation, however, Rivers abandoned her dreams of being an entertainer for a more practical career. She went to work as a buyer for a chain store and eventually fell in love with the owner's son. But this relationship didn't last. The couple split up six months after tying the knot. Rivers returned to her passion for performing. Determined to succeed, she appeared in a number of small plays, including a role as a lesbian opposite an equally unknown Barbara Streisand. When it became apparent that acting was not her forte, she switched to comedy and spent the next seven years doing the rounds of New York's comedy clubs. She used the stage name of Pepper January for a while, but on the suggestion of her agent, Tony Rivers, changed it to Joan Rivers. For over 50 years, Joan pioneered her own brand of irreverent, unconventional comedy, first enduring tawdry clubs, borscht belt showrooms and grimy Greenwich Village cabarets. She was never one to give up and her relentless work ethic allowed her comedy to evolve and her audiences continued to grow. She soon headlined in Las Vegas and throughout the United States as well as in the United Kingdom, Ireland, Australia and Canada. Her fame skyrocketed in 1968 when she first appeared on The Tonight Show starring Johnny Carson. Within three years she was hosting that show with Joan Rivers, one of the first syndicate daytime talk shows on the air, and made television history as the permanent guest host of The Tonight Show, where she coined her iconic catchphrase. In 1984, Joan received her first Grammy nomination for her gold-selling comedy album, What Becomes a Semi-Legend Most. While standing in for Carson, Rivers interviewed countless stars, including a very young Oprah Winfrey. She was adored by many in the comedy world, even by colourful characters like Miss Piggy. She was a long-time friend of Donald Trump. She even won season eight of his show The Apprentice in 2009. Although Rivers was known for her biting humour and constant laughter, in May 1987 her life was shocked with tragedy. 
Joan Rivers had everything she ever wanted, fame and fortune, the job of her dreams, a loyal husband, a loving child, a lavish estate, and a future that beckoned with enticing possibilities. After years of struggle, she had not only succeeded as a comedian, but made history on the newly launched Fox Network as television's first and only female late-night talk show host. 1986 was a big year for Joan Rivers. She was playing sold-out shows all over the country. She released a new book, Enter Talking, and she was a fixture on television as the permanent guest host on Johnny Carson's The Tonight Show, which at the time was late night's most popular show. She won over host Johnny Carson. With the cameras rolling, he told her, you're going to be a star, and indeed her career took off. He gave me everything, she said. After more than two decades of climbing the comedy ladder with her brassy spitfire humour, the self-proclaimed last girl in Larchmont had finally become a real star. Following her successful turn on The Tonight Show, Edgar Rosenberg entered River's life in 1965. Taken with his British charm and sophistication and obsessive commitment to show business, she in a courthouse just four days after they met. We filled each other's gaps like two pieces of a puzzle. I gave him warmth, he gave me style. After daughter Melissa was born in 1968, Rivers continued her winning streak in the 1970s with appearances on popular programmes including The Carol Burnett Show and Hollywood Squares. Still, Rivers always put family first. Besides acting, Rivers directed Billy Crystal and Doris Roberts in 1978's Rabbit Test, a comedy about the world's first pregnant man, and wrote a 1973 TV movie, The Girl Most Likely To, about an unattractive woman who undergoes plastic surgery and becomes beautiful. Rivers herself had always been open about her own nips and tucks over the years. I thinned my nose and raised the tip, had my eyes done, a full facelift, liposuction, breast reduction, chin tucks, Botox, collagen. I'm sure I've spent at least $80,000 over the years. By this point, Rivers' act had long since become primarily self-parody. Complaints about her looks had given way to jokes about plastic surgery. I wish I had a twin so I could see what I'd look like without it. She played herself on the American TV series Nip and Tuck, and in the cartoon series Futurama, appeared as a talking head kept alive for thousands of years. Rivers' career continued to climb through the 1980s. My whole career has been one rejection after another, and then going back and back and pushing against everything and everybody, getting ahead by small, ugly steps. 1986 was also the year Fox offered Rivers her own show, as a competitor to The Tonight Show, after Rivers accepted the offer, Carson, her friend, mentor and champion of 20 years, never spoke to her again. She'd sacrificed her relationship with her mentor. Rivers, in her mid-fifties at the nadir of her life, both professionally and personally, cradles a gun in her lap, contemplating suicide. And now she'd lost it all. In May 1987, the First Lady of Comedy was fired from her job and publicly humiliated. Her husband, Edgar, Unable to bear his own failure as her manager and producer, killed himself. Just after Rosenberg's death, she discovered that he'd also blown their fortune on a series of bad investments. Reeling with grief and rage, Rivers then discovered she was broke. She had earned millions of dollars and lived a life of baroque luxury, and now it's all gone. She was $37 million in debt, and her opportunities for making more money had vanished. In her middle age, it was all slipping through her fingers. She was single, without a source of income, and unhirable. To make matters worse, her only child, her daughter Melissa, her emotional touchstone, blamed her for Rosenberg's death. But the pudgy Jewish girl from Larchmont, who struggled all her life with deep self-loathing and insecurity, had fought tooth and nail to wrangle a husband, to prove herself as a performer, to gain entry into the hostile male-dominated world of comedy. Faced with personal tragedy and humiliating professional defeat, Rivers didn't give up. Instead, she reinvented herself and by the 2000s returned to the centre of the conversation, bigger and better than ever. She had lost everything at an age in life when women normally can't recover, no matter what field they work in and especially in the entertainment industry, which is notoriously unforgiving to ageing women. You would think it was hopeless. 
1989, less than two years after her husband's death, Rivers went back to work. She developed a new daytime television program, The Joan Rivers Show. Unlike her ill-fated foray into late night, The Joan Rivers Show was an immediate hit. Rivers won a daytime Emmy for Outstanding Talk Show Host in 1990, and the show was nominated for several other awards. It ran for five seasons. Unlike her late-night show, Rivers' daytime talk show was a huge success. Also in 1990, Rivers began her long-running association with the QVC channel, where she sold her own line of, usually bedazzled, jewellery, clothing and accessories. At the time, Rivers chalked up the decision to start hawking her wares to debt. My career was over, I had a lot of bills to pay, I have a very large family, and we all take care of each other. The Joan Rivers Classic Collection would turn into an enormously successful venture, however, amassing over $1 billion in sales and becoming one of QVC's top-selling lines. Moreover, her appearances on the Shopping Channel, which continued until her death in 2014, became yet another venue to make people laugh. Rivers and her daughter teamed up for a TV movie as a form of therapy. Rivers and Melissa shared a truly spectacular bond. They teamed up to publicly reckon with Edgar's suicide in the form of a made-for-TV movie, Tears and Laughter, the Joan and Melissa Rivers story, premiered in May of that year, with the pair playing real-life versions of themselves as they come to terms with Edgar's death. At first, critics accused Rivers of exploiting the tragedy for dramatic effect. Later, many credited the film with helping destigmatize suicide. Rivers said she paid no mind to the initial backlash. It was very therapeutic for Melissa and me, she said. Edgar's death was so raw, so we bonded tremendously. The same year, E asked Rivers to host the Golden Globes pre-show Red Carpet. In 1995, she and Melissa hosted the carpet for the Academy Awards, interviewing celebrities as they paraded by. Melissa knew someone at E, and they were saying, Who should we put out on the red carpet? It is a horrible job and no one was doing it then, and Melissa said, My mother. Rivers added, It was a very low time for me. Rivers miraculously persevered. Her comeback was stunning. She reached greater heights as a comedian than ever before built a billion dollar business. Rivers understood that she was part of a new transitional comedy generation which was leaving the one-line joke litany of traditional comics far behind. May had been a pioneer of the new style, a much more personal comedy, that described humour behaviour by describing her own behaviour. Rivers used this style to talk openly about her emotional travails and also about sex. I was becoming a nice Jewish girl in stockings and pumps, saying on stage what people thought but never said aloud in polite society. Mentioning the word tampons, she recalled, was the greatest challenge of her career. Despite her edgy routines, she never downplayed her Jewishness, even though her agent often warned her that she was too Jewish and too New York for much of the country. The self-deprecatory style that became the river's trademark coexisted with a much more aggressive humour that targets others, often with great cruelty. Over her long career, Rivers also introduced feminist characters with hostile jokes aimed at gynaecologists and others in the male power structure who demeaned women. Whichever the routine, Rivers spat out nervy jokes full of chutzpah. To some critics, she was abrasive, tasteless, profane. Rivers defended herself against such charges. You have to be abrasive to be a current comic. If you don't offend someone, you become pap. Comedy is power, she said. The only weapon more formidable than humour is a gun. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Joan Rivers? She was the first woman to break the glass ceiling of male-hosted late-night television.